<laughs> okay, Sally. Welcome. Thank you. Thank you. Welcome to Louisiana Literature. It's such a pleasure. Uh, I will just tell everybody here that I'll be happy to sign Sally's books when she's <laughs> going. <laughs> I formally grant you permission to do that. Great. I think that's a great okay, idea. It is. Right. Mm -hmm. Okay. So how are you? Very well, thank you. <coughs> I'm, st I'm in awe of how many people are in this room. It's amazing. It's amazing to see so many people here. Thank you all so much for coming. And wow. you know, for a cultural institution, this kind of audience is like solid gold. <laughs> is, normally people are 75 years older and uh, look like people's uh, great-grandparents. So <laughs> this, is, this is perfect and please stay forever, uh, all of you. <laughs> you know, when I received uh, the, the email uh, with the invitation to interview Sally, uh, I knew, of course, that she, was a, or she is a young uh, literary star. Uh, so I said, yes, of course, uh, by all means. I didn't know how young, actually, 20... Mm. And at that time, probably even younger, so 27, Seven. yes, exactly. And, and also, I didn't know that you already did two books at the time, because you just finished your second one, yeah. it's out T tomorrow. tomorrow. It's the day after tomorrow. The day it's after Tuesday. tomorrow, yeah. okay. Two books. <laughs> and I also didn't know that it actually was her that I read a beautiful little essay in the New Yorker of uh, last year, but now I do. I also quickly learned about the degree in American literature. Mm -hmm. Uh, also, the fact that you are editing a literary magazine. Yes, I Which am. is called... The Stinging Fly. Exactly. Yeah. Uh, and I also found out that Sally Rooney is a skilled debater Ooh. of any issue, mm. really. Mm. Uh, <laughs> a, 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 you know, a real uh, fighter in debate contests. Mm. So you could talk about any issue, and you have, you have been talking about any issue yes. in Ireland, in Europe, and you also won some big European contest. Yeah. yeah. Exactly. Yeah. So, <laughs> you could, yeah. so we could argue or discuss anything. I, yes, we, let's not put that to we, the test we, right we, now. And but you, <laughs> you could pretend to be the expert or actually be the expert. You know, yeah, we'd definitely be pretending. Uh, and yeah. uh, we could talk about writing and about literary, uh, literary history, about art, politics, religion, uh, or love. What should we talk about, do you think? Love? You think we should talk about love? I think we should talk about love. Because uh, your book here, Conversations uh, with Friends, and also the new one, which I read, uh, are about love. But I would like to ask you, really, is this a love story? Um, yes, I actually, I think it is. Um, it's, it's not uh, necessarily a conventional love story, but it's certainly about what it means to love someone or, or more than one someone. Um, and it's, it's not something that I set out to explore. I didn't sit down one day and decide, oh, I need to write a novel exploring the, what it means to love and, and the philosophical substance of what love feels like. I didn't have any of this on my mind. I sort of came up with these characters who we meet in the opening pages of the book and um, and I wanted to know what would happen to them, so I followed them yes. through, through the narrative, um, taking many, many wrong turns along the way, but eventually ending up with, with this. Um, but as I did that, I suppose I found out that what interested me about these people's lives was um, love. And, and I don't mean love in a, in a very conventional, sort of romantic sense, like you meet one person who you love and then you love them and that's the end of your love life. It's concluded and you've loved someone, so well done. Um, it's sort of, it's, I'm interested in all, like, you know, familial love, love between friends, um, love between siblings, love obviously also between um, romantic partners and, and, you know, and questioning what is, what is that, um, the kind of love that's so central to our culture, which is monogamous pair bonded love, yes. and it's sort of the, it's seen as the epitome of what love really means. Um, just trying to explore that. Why is that so central to our idea of what it means to be a human being? And when we talk about the relationship between empathy and compassion and love, is that the kind of love that we're talking about? Mm. Um, let's, ju let's just remind people, I mean, most of you have, of course, read the, 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 the book or, or will read the book tonight, but. Uh, but uh, let's just remind people mm. what, what this is about. You're talking about love between different people. We're yep. talking about actually four different people. Yes. So it's about Francis and Bobby. Yeah. Uh, and what happens? 
Well, um, in this book, we it's it's narrated in the first person by a, a, our protagonist, a young woman called Frances, who's studying in in Dublin, and her best friend, who's also her ex girlfriend, Bobby, um, and. In the very opening pages of the book, they meet a married couple who are like a young married couple, but older than they are. You know, they're in their 30s, um, uh, called Nick and Melissa. And really, the whole book is about exploring the that sort of rectangular dynamic, those four points. What are all the different connections that can spring up between them? And there's something almost mathematical about it. Like if I move one point, how do all the other points move in response? How do those dynamics shift? Um, and it felt to me while I was writing it that I was just really interested in that. Every time I moved one, I was interested to see how all the others moved. And every time I sort of um, plucked a string between two dynamics to hear all the other ones resonate, yeah. it was just like an interesting process for me. And I didn't know if it would ever interest any reader. I didn't know if it would ever be interesting to anyone other than me. So It will, but it does interest the people in the book because they're talking a lot. Oh, they talk they about it all the time. They have conversations with <laughs> friends, yeah. as it's called. And they're talking, especially... Uh, the protagonist, uh, Frances, the main character, and her friend Bobby are talking about love. Mm -hmm. <coughs> and there is a, this conversation, uh, they do have conversations in talking face-to-face. Uh, mm -hmm. -face. They also have a lot of conversations in writing. and mm -hmm. They're messaging on Facebook or yep. they're texting and so on. And, it, and, and it, they are quite similar, actually. They don't change a lot mm -hmm. whether they're writing or talking, yeah. I think. And that's very interesting. But one of them, in one of them... Uh, Francis and Bobby are talking about uh, 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 about love, and maybe we should just read that because uh, <coughs> I think that that's something that we should talk about here. Right. Uh, and uh, if you are Bobby, yeah, she's 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 also the most beautiful uh, of the two. <laughs> True. Uh, and I'm Francis, of course. Good. Yeah. <coughs> I never get to be Bobby. Uh, yeah. That's good. No, uh, I, I, you know, Francis uh, is uh, kind of more inward looking mm -hmm. and, and so on. Mm -hmm. So. So I'm like her. So, okay, you're Bobby and I'm her. So you go. And, and this is a, a, a messaging conversation. In, an instant message conversation. Okay. And it's not one that actually happens during the book. At this point in the book, Frances is searching through her old instant messages with Bobby because mm. she wants to sort of reconstruct an image of what their friendship was like before they met this married couple and everything started to get confusing. So she goes through the instant messages and this is one of the conversations that she yes, finds. Yes. So I will read Bobby's lines. Nice. Um, if you look at love as something other than an interpersonal phenomenon and try to understand it as a social value system, it's both antithetical to capitalism in that it challenges the axiom of selfishness, which dictates the whole logic of inequality. That was four or five They're all different messages. messages. Yes, exactly, um, and I haven't uh, replied yet. <laughs> <laughs> but I'm typing very quickly. Yeah. And, and yet it's also subservient and facilitatory that is, mothers selflessly raising children without any profit motive, which seems to contradict the demands of the market at one level, and yet actually just functions to provide workers for free. Yes. <laughs> Capitalism harnesses love for profit. Yes? Yes, it's me again. Uh, love is the discursive practice and unpaid labor is the effect. But I mean, I get that I'm anti-love as such. That's vapid, Francis. Yes. You have to do more than say you're anti-things. Okay, right. This is the conversation, and Francis says that she's anti-love as such. That's quite a statement, mm. isn't it? Is this something that she just says because it sounds right, or does she feel that love is, Im is impossible for her? Well, I think she does, and I think in that in that context, the conversation that they're having is about, um, you know, capitalist social structures and about the transactional nature of um, the way that you know our social world is structured now, and also about how how gender plays into that, how women are expected to. Um, give much more of themselves in personal relationships than traditionally men have been expected to. And so taking all those kind of very broad power dynamics into account, I guess Francis just feels like, so what's the point? Maybe it's all a lie. I right. mean, wh what is there? <coughs> Maybe I don't want to give but of it myself. It also you know? made me feel that, that these people in, in your book, especially the two young women here, mm -hmm. that, ha that they have principles that guide their life, their love life. It has to adhere to certain principles in a way. Mm -hmm. Is that true? Is that how they is that how they go about it? Do you think? 
Um, I think that's how they would like to go about it. I don't know that their principles are always successful. In, right, in but, but they would like? So that, that's, they, that's yeah. more, you think so? Well, yeah. everyone would like to live by their principles. Well, really? Yeah. <laughs> would they? Would they? I think they would. Yeah, when, I think when, they would. When it comes to love. Yeah, because the, um, I think... I mean, if you, if, you, if you have principles, they have to be able to encompass that. Mm -hmm. If you have principles that you truly believe, they have to be able to encompass the idea of human love and intimacy. And if your principles can't, then you're left with, well, it doesn't make sense for me. It doesn't, it doesn't make sense to give that much of myself to another person because it, it's not part of the, right. my ideology or my belief system. It, right. does, it, can't, it can't accommodate that. Um, and I think that's what Francis is feeling at that point. But that conversation takes place before she meets these people. <laughs> right, okay, yes, exactly. <laughs> yeah. We'll come to that in a second. But so, so when, when writing about about, well, two young women's uh, love life, were you thinking also about how how people in that age actually go around relationships and love life. And, and, and how did that connect with this writing? You mean, was I trying to observe something generationally yes, specific? Yes, is there something generationally here? I, it's so hard um, to say that because I, you know, my experience of life has been so limited and I belong to the generation that I belong to and have never belonged to another one. So it's, it's really hard for me to say when I try and make a statement about, oh, people my age feel this way. Well, first of all, a lot of people my age don't feel anything like what I feel and that's, that's obviously fine. Um, but also, it's quite possible that people you know, 20 or 30 or 40, 50 years older ha read this book and think, oh yeah, that's a little bit like what it was like for me too, and yes. I don't. I don't necessarily think that all these experiences are generationally specific. Some of the forms that the experiences take, like the instant message conversation, like the idea of looking through your old instant messages and reading over them, those are a little bit generationally specific. That's something my parents would not have done, and it's right. something I can do. But does the does the overall um, feeling, the experience on the level of feeling, change that much? It's just something I can't speak to. I because, don't know the answer. Because I was, I was struck by the way that they have all these principled conversations mm -hmm. about how things should be, mm -hmm. not least their partner. Mm. Ha has to, in, in some way, live up to certain principles. Uh, and that sounds quite tough. It sounds very tough mm -hmm. to, uh, to, to go about life like that. And of course, Frances meets Nick mm -hmm. and falls, I'm not sure if she falls in love, but actually she, she feels something for him. Mm -hmm. And of course, that doesn't, I mean, I mean, that's very unprincipled of her. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's a big fucking cliche. <laughs> he's, a, he's a married man. Yeah. Uh, she's the other woman. Mm. It's, uh, I mean, if you were a Marxist, you could all, which she probably claims to yeah. be, right? She, you could read all kinds of power relations mm -hmm. into, that, into that affair. Sure. So, uh, so it must be very disappointing for her. It is, it is. And I, and I think also, um, it's as you say, it's such a cliche. So she becomes an archetype at this point. She yes. is the young ingenue. She's the college student. He's the uh, he's not old. He's like 32, but he's slightly older. Yeah, exactly. Um, <laughs> that, that, I, mean, I, would, I would say that's what I thought. He's yeah. not really old. He's not, he's not, no, old, he's not old, old at all. And he's closer to my age yeah, than he is young, to, yeah. to Fran than I am to Francis's yes. age. But. Um, but, for, but when you're 21, an age gap of 11 years can seem like a lot, I'm sure. Um, so in so many ways, then, it's, it's, she's engaging in a story which she has already heard. She understands the archetypes that this story conforms to. And actually, I think that that prevents her from understanding what's really happening. Because yes. she... Um, sort of superimposes a familiar narrative on what's going on in her personal life that makes it easy for her to make sense of the other people in her life. She knows the role that she's playing, she's the other woman, she's like the younger mistress, and Nick is like the older man, and um, Melissa's sort of the betrayed wife who Francis sees as quite cold. Um, and so all of that actually is not really what's happening. That's not a very good description of what's happening. And I think slowly as the novel progresses, if I've, if I've done any justice to what I was trying to do, she begins to see that those archetypes can't actually exhaust the complexity right. of... She's very blessé about it. In well, the, uh, in the beginning, yeah. yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, but I think that it's a struggle for her to try and see past the kind of discourse, the kind of cliches and archetypes that are so familiar to her, particularly because she's a, a student of English, so she's read all the novels about exactly. affairs. Yes. Um, yeah. So, <laughs> so to, yeah. see, to see the specificity of her own experience and of Nick's experience and yes. of Melissa's and Bobby's as well, yeah. to get past the archetype and into something more complex. Yes. Can we just jump into literary history for a second? 
Yeah, we can I mean, try. Of course, I mean, because I mean, this is your first novel, and it is. I mean, I mean, I mean, you hesitated a little bit, but it is. I think it's a very good novel about love. It really is, well, and we we'll get back. We we'll get, get back to it in a second. Uh, but but of course, I mean, there have been one or two books before you about love. Mm. Uh, what, what has what 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 have, there? Yeah, Just, what, uh... what have what I mean? What what have inspired? Do you read love? Uh, love stories, really? Yeah, I mean, I, I, of course I do. And I think the, the history of the novel is really a history of, of uh, the, love, the love story. And, I, and I, I mean, I say that the only novel that I'm familiar with is really the tradition of the English novel. I don't know so much about um, the tradition of the novel in other languages. Um, and it's something I would like to get to know more about, certainly. But in, in the history of the English novel, really, um, it coalesced as a form around the marriage plot, like around the late 18th, early 19th century, when novels began to be really widely read and literacy improved hugely. The novel form um, was different from the epics that had preceded it because it wasn't about wars and it wasn't about national struggles. It was about like, who is this one woman going to marry, this guy or the other guy? And that was like the whole story of the novel. Um, and, 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 that's, and I mean, that was what was new about it. That was why it was called a novel, um, because it was a, it was a form of storytelling that took place on a slightly different scale and in a different way, in the English tradition anyway. So, I mean, obviously, that's, that's almost like the defining characteristic of the classic novel is that it involves yes. marriages and, and love stories. The so, struggle really just to find the right yeah, person. Yeah, but also the question of whether there is such a thing as a right person. Right. Um, and go, I mean, and so you start with Austen, who obviously yeah. um, is so good at constructing those yeah. plots perfectly, um, but, the, the, but they resolve themselves very neatly too. And, and in my opinion, very satisfyingly, I love Jane Austen. Um, and when I get to the end, I believe that they are going to be happy together. But I think probably for, <laughs> for a critical reader, you could say maybe there are some questions. Like, are Darcy and Elizabeth really going to share a long, happy, untroubled life? Yes, they, um, yes, may, they I, are. I, I like to think that. Yeah. Didn't you read the sequel? <laughs> <laughs> um, Emma and Knightley definitely will, but, mm -hmm. but Elizabeth and Darcy I have questions about. But, but then you get, obviously, as the novel develops as a why form... Do you see, why do you think that Elizabeth and Darcy will be unhappy? After? Oh, because <laughs> I'm sure everyone has opinions about this, but I think Darcy's characterization leads me to believe... I mean, in the beginning of the novel, he's not a very nice man. And well, he, he, because he hasn't met her yet. No, well, okay, but that's, that's kind of this pedagogical idea of the romance story, that, that you, can, you can... Change each other? That you can change each other... Yes. Yeah, that you can change each other morally, which, yes. is, which is nice to believe, yes. yeah. But, but I think... <laughs> But I, and, and, maybe, and maybe it is true. It I don't know that I believe that it's necessarily... It's true for Emma, so maybe it's also true for Darcy, but it's a, it's a reversal of the, of the ordinary gendered trope that we see in, in those books. Right. But, I, I mean, as you move through the 19th century, you get those stories become a little bit more complex, and so novelists like George Eliot, later again, mm. novelists like Henry is there, James... Is there a specific love story that, if I ask you, what love story would you take, take with you to, to an island without your boyfriend? Um... What is what is the love story? Uh, other than the story of me and my boyfriend, um, of course. I, <laughs> yeah, I mean that's a difficult one because the 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 ones that have moved me most lately, actually, um, I recently read uh, for the first time a Portrait of a Lady, the Henry James novel, and um, that novel moved me a huge amount. And and it, but but it's sad. For, but you, most of you probably already know that, so I'm not spoiling it. But it's it's a very sad novel, and. Um, Austen's love stories end happily, and the, and the later love stories of George Eliot, and particularly of Henry James, and, and later again, end sadly. Yes. They don't resolve themselves into that shape that makes us feel satisfied <sighs> at the end in the same way as earlier novels in that form do. Yeah. Um, so I wonder why that is. I'm drawn, lately I'm drawn to the ones that end on a sad note, or that really? end with a feeling that maybe it's not possible, it can't be reconciled. In this extremely market-driven, transactional society, mm. in this very patriarchal social form, it's not it can't be done. You can't. Why, why, why are you drawn to the, those? I lately? wish I knew. I don't right. know. And I don't think that I'm all that pessimistic about the possibilities of redemption and, you know, even in this political mess that we find ourselves in. But, but, I, but lately, those are the books that I've been reading, and I, I, I don't know why. <coughs> we'll talk about that maybe next mm. year or the day after. <laughs> you're, you're writing a book a year, so you're coming back yeah. next year. <laughs> yeah, I'll okay. keep that up. What, what I thought about when I was uh, reading the first part of this book uh, was I, I was worried that, uh, that all the four people there, and also the people they are talking to, there's a lot of people, you know, in, mm -hmm. in, their, in their big group, actually 
that love to them was a kind, was only about self realization. Mm. Mm -hmm. Is that is that so? Is that what they thought? Is that because it's all it's all it seems like being about themselves and about how people react to them. Yeah. Or how they react to people and not about the relationship. Yeah, and that's it's something that I um that I was definitely interested in on a political level. When I when I started thinking about um the political structures um that sort of um, dominate the world around me uh, when I was in my teens, I was coming at it from a feminist perspective. Um, I think because I was just so in my own self and that was the, those were the struggles that seemed to actually touch on my life in some way and I couldn't see outside that at all and I'm obviously still just beginning to struggle to try and see outside my own, <laughs> my own life and existence. But certainly approaching it through that paradigm, yes. um, I was, I was attached to ideas about independence and, and female agency, like the idea of the individual woman being sort of a sacrosanct um, unit and that nothing should ever violate that unit and that it was an independent unit that could move through the world um, uh, sort of complete within itself. And that seemed to me like a principle of feminist philosophy, that sort of individuality for the woman was very significant. And the... There's some, there, there must be some dangers to that when yes, entering... Uh, yeah, well, love. As no, a, yes, or as or, a, <laughs> or or any serious human engagement, yes. romantic love, or any yes. kind of love. Okay, you know. let, let me just stop you there because <clears throat> I will now do something that is quite unconventional. But you are Irish, so you're used to that. So <laughs> uh, I, I don't know why I said that, but uh, <laughs> uh, but uh, but but I will ask you to to read the end of the book. It's mm -hmm. a total spoiler. Uh, we'll now actually. So so uh, so any of you who uh, have not read the book, think about it, something else. Uh, is it okay? Close Are your people... ears. No, 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 don't ask that question. <laughs> uh, you're going to do that because the end is amazing and it doesn't really matter that you know okay. the end. You can <laughs> okay. read it anyhow. Okay, okay. and, and, and uh, tell us what happened. Is, I mean, Nick and Francis, the, the two main characters who have been together for a long time, it's very turbulent. They, are, they, they, they end the relationship mm -hmm. Uh, and months go by, yeah. and suddenly Frances' phone rings. Yes. And what happens? Um, so they, as you say, haven't spoken in months. Her, f her phone rings, she's going Christmas shopping, and it's, and it's Nick, who she hasn't heard from in a long time, and they've been having an affair, and then the affair has ended, so. Yes. Um, she picks up the phone, and mm. he has called her accidentally. Um, he was supposed to call his wife, but mm. he rang her number by accident. Um, and he thinks that he's speaking to his wife, who's in the supermarket. So he's, he's in the supermarket, so he's saying something boring about groceries, and Francis has to tell him, yeah. it's me, it's not your wife, it's the other one. Um, so he's obviously um, embarrassed, and, and she's embarrassed, but, but the conversation continues. For and a long time. For a long time. Yes. Yeah, so they have a long phone conversation. She's wandering around a bookshop, and she's distracted. She's wandering down Dawson Street in Dublin yeah. towards St. Stephen's And Green. the thing is that he, she hasn't been talking or thinking about her, him for a long time. Yeah. Many, many pages without him being mm, mentioned. He wasn't in the book, yeah. Okay, and okay. Then, then they talk like this. Um, so I'm just going to... <laughs> I'm just going to read the very, very end of this conversation, and I've been in instructed. You, heard, he made, he's making me do it. So I'm sorry if, if any of you don't want to hear this. It's just, yes, yeah. Yes, there's another book coming out tomorrow. So exactly. <laughs> I won't spoil that one. Um, <laughs> So they've been talking for a long time at this point, and she's now, um, she, she realizes that he's actually in the city center. She's in the city center as well. He's in a supermarket, and she's on St. Stephen's Green. As I got closer to the gate, I heard the bell ringing. The noise of traffic opened up again, like a light getting brighter and brighter. Does it have to be complicated, I said. Yeah, I think so. There's the thing with Bobby, which is important to me. You're telling me, he said. I'm married. It's always going to be fucked up like this, isn't it? But I'll compliment you more this time. I was at the gate. I wanted to tell him about the church. That was a different conversation. I wanted things from him that would make everything else complicated. Like what kind of compliment, I said. I have one that's not really a compliment, but I think you'll like it. Okay, tell me. Remember the first time we kissed, he said, at the party. And I said, I didn't think the utility room was a good place to be kissing, and we left. You know, I went up to my room and waited for you, right? I mean, for hours. And at first, I really thought you would come. It was probably the most wretched I ever felt in my life, this kind of ecstatic wretchedness that, in a way, I was practically enjoying. 
Because even if you did come upstairs, what then? The house was full of people. It's not like anything was going to happen. But every time I thought of going back down again, I would imagine hearing you on the stairs, and I couldn't leave. I mean, I physically couldn't. Anyway, how I felt then, knowing that you were close by and feeling completely paralyzed by it. This phone call is very similar. If I told you where my car is right now, I don't think I'd be able to leave. I think I would have to stay here just in case you changed your mind about everything. You know, I still have that impulse to be available to you. You'll notice I didn't buy anything in the supermarket. I closed my eyes. Things and people moved around me, taking positions in obscure hierarchies, participating in systems I didn't know about and never would. A complex network of objects and concepts. You live through certain things before you understand them. You can't always take the analytical position. Come and get me, I said. Yes. <laughs> yes, come and get me is, is the last sentence in mm. the book. And it's so liberating because it makes everything in the book make sense. And, oh. you have to, and I just feel like reading it all over again in that light. Mm -hmm. Because it's very surprising. Did, you, what, did this end surprise you too? Yeah, it was the last scene in the book that I wrote and I had been struggling with the ending for a long time. Um, you know, if, if any of you have read any of the book really, or even, or even listened to us talking about it, um, there's obviously a lot of different ways that it could go. There are several different relationships in play, which of them are going to be sustained, which of them are going to end, who is going to hate each other by the end of the book. Um, and I feel like when I was writing it, I tried basically every possible outcome. I did the one where they never see each other again. I did the one where she and Bobby don't see each other again. I, and I... And it was so much longer, and then it was so much shorter, and I just couldn't get it right. And then uh, one day I sat down, and, and it was almost like I realized I don't have to... It was like the opposite of what you say. It was like, I, I, I don't have to make everything make sense. I don't have to go through every yeah, element yeah. of the book that I've introduced and make sure that everything is ticked off and everything is tied up together and everyone understands. And, and it, with that in mind, with that feeling of kind of looseness, I sat down and wrote this scene um, starting in, in uh, if any of you know Dublin, starting at the bottom of Dawson Street and going up Dawson Street into St. Stephen's Green around and then into one of the benches. Um, and it was like moving with Francis as I did that. I felt like I was, I, and I know that walk very well, walking, walking. And, I, and as they were talking, I understood, oh, this is, I'm, I'm finishing my book now. I'm going to finish my and book. What? And then I wrote the last sentence and I was like, I oh. finished my book. Yeah. <laughs> um, so it was. It so was, you didn't it was know a, from the beginning? No, I didn't know from the beginning. Not, I didn't even know from halfway through or two thirds of the way through or five sixths of the way but through. It's, how, it's almost, you know how, I mean, you, you, it's, 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 it's a weird thing, crazy. It's a big thing to know about a book that you actually have been reading that, that you didn't know where it was going to end. No, yeah. I mean... <laughs> It yeah. could have ended somewhere else. Could have ended anywhere else. It could no, have. it couldn't because it couldn't. Well, no, this Obviously book Obviously, it could not have. No. But the book that I was writing could have. Yes. Yeah. I mean, there's so much of a difference when, when you're the one who, who's written the book. There's such a big difference between the living text that yes. you're still working on and taking chunks out of and putting chunks back into, moving yeah. stuff around, and, and this, like, item, yes. which is a product that people can purchase. Yes. Um, it's, like, so difficult to make them fit together because one of them is, like, the this thing that I lived with for such a long time, and I was making little changes, and I was making big changes, and I was looking at the word count, and, and this is like not that. It's something else, and I don't know what it is. But is, but there, also, is there also a very, uh, another point to this, apart from these two people actually, to their own surprise, loving each other like this, mm -hmm. uh, is there also a point to, to, to that, that love in the way that they have been pretending cannot be shared? between three, four, five, six people, mm -hmm. that love is, uh, you know, it's, uh, if you do the math, it equals two. Yeah. I don't know. I don't, I don't think that that was, I don't think that that is the case for these characters. But, but isn't it? No, it happened? I don't think it is. I don't think it is. I'm going to have to disagree with you there. I, I, don't, I don't think that it is because I think, I first of all think that Nick is going to remain married. I don't think he's going to leave his wife. And I don't think that Francis and Bobby are going to part ways. I think that it's going to stay a very complicated situation. And that's not me trying to make a didactic statement about monogamy or, or anything like that. It's just, it was just trying to let myself live with the complexities and not 
fence everything off at the end and, and put everyone back in couples again because it just felt like that was too yes. easy. I, maybe I agree. He, he might not actually leave his wife. Yeah, he's, he's such a... Uh, <laughs> 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 yeah. Right. A lot but of but that, that. that doesn't really matter. It's like the Darcy discussion mm. we just had. It doesn't really matter. The question, I mean, the last sentence is come and get me. Mm-hmm. I mean, that's, that's, that's authentic, right? And that's on, and that's undividable. That's unshareable. That's mm-hmm. between the two of them. Mm-hmm. And what I feel there is that the, the liberating, the liberating part of it is that it feels like so that 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 in a few pages it turns around and concludes that you can change each other, mm-hmm. which you said before that you are not sure. No, I do believe. I do mm. believe that people can change each other. I, I believe people don't have any choice but to change each other. There is no you without others. I mean, there's no version of yourself that isn't constantly influenced by everybody else in your life. I mean, even the fact that we use language is obviously, it's a human invention and we got it from other people. We didn't invent it for ourselves. So everything we know about ourselves comes from other people telling us and showing us. Um, yeah. So I don't believe there's any such thing as the, the individual unit that just moves through the world unaffected by other well, things. But also because it, it, it reflects Reflects in language, doesn't it? I mean, when they have these conversations about Marxism and the power power in mm-hmm. relationships and so on, I mean, it's a totally different language than the language of love between two people. Mm-hmm. I mean, a Marxist analysis between Bobby and Francis doesn't sound like "come and get me." No, it's totally different. Yeah, but I mean, yeah, but is it? Because I think. It's always difficult to make the language of theory and whether that's Marxist theory or it's philosophy or you know any 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 language that we use to try and explain human experience on an analytical or conceptual level whatever you're drawn to whether it's Marxism or feminism or it's non or it's not political it's philosophical theory and um, it's always so hard to make that idea make sense in your everyday very mundane life or in your intimate personal relationships how do you apply that theory how do you bring that down to that level or or bring or bring it up to that level um So that for me is something very interesting. Um, It's something that I'm interested in following like a thread through my work is like, how do I take the ideas and beliefs and principles like we spoke about that I believe to be true Mm. and make sense of them, not in a broad social or political way, but in the very miniature way of Mm. people's intimate lives um, of love stories. How can a love story be Marxist? Well, I don't know the answer to that question. Um, Maybe it doesn't have an answer, but I'm interested in asking it. But a love story cannot be Marxist, can it? Yeah, I think it can. Yeah, I think it can. I'm figuring it out. Next book, we'll see. But I'm, I'm I think it can, yeah, yeah. Well, then it has to be revolutionary Marxism. Yeah. <laughs> it has to. The only kind, yeah. Right. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Because, because the, your second book, right, mm-hmm. starts with, with, with uh, we have six more minutes now, so okay. we, have, we have to, to do this uh, properly. You know, the last, the second book which is out, uh, mm-hmm. is, it, is it actually tomorrow, Monday or I Tuesday? I think it's Tuesday. It is. Yeah. You think? You don't know when? Uh, it's Tuesday. <laughs> it's Tuesday. Okay. Uh, it, it starts, we, we can't talk too much now about uh, what it's about and we shouldn't because we spoiled the whole, uh, the, your first book now. Uh, but, it, but there is a quote in the beginning from George Eliot who you mentioned before. Yes. Just remind us who George Eliot is. Oh, um, so George Eliot uh, was a British novelist, a 19th century novelist, famous for writing Middlemarch. Um, George Eliot was a pen name, she was a female novelist. Um, and also wrote uh, the novel Daniel Deronda, which uh, has given me the epigraph for my, for my second book. Right. Yeah. And there is this, you have to listen carefully now, because it's, it's a bit difficult English, but, mm-hmm. uh, but please read this quote that you start your second book with. Um, it is one of the secrets in that change of mental poise, which has been fitly named conversion, that to many among us, neither heaven nor earth has any revelation till some personality touches theirs with a peculiar influence, subduing them into receptiveness. Hmm. It, did you get it, all of you? <coughs> what I'm does, still not what, sure I get it, so... Right. Um, what, it, I mean, it, what it says, in short, mm-hmm. is that it is, it is one of the big secrets of of human mentality mm-hmm. or, or uh, you know, the way people think and behave uh, is uh, that you can't really change in any way, convert mm-hmm. is the word here, mm-hmm. uh, before uh, you touch someone else. Mm-hmm. 
that influences really influences you. Yeah. And, I mean, and this this quote could not have started your first book because that then then I would have known I, that I was I should be ready for a real love story. <laughs> yeah. But this one starts your second novel. Yes. Is, is is this then a love story from the beginning? Yes, the second book is definitely a, lo a love story from the beginning, um, and it's. I mean, I think in the in the first book, there's sort of a some of the tension is generated by not quite knowing whether these characters really should be together or not. And I think in the second book, um, we meet the characters when they're sort of 17 or 18, and we follow them over the course of a few years, four years. Um, I think we probably always know that they love each other very much, but we just don't know. I just didn't know when I was writing it. What does that mean when, in you know, in in the social world that they inhabit, in their personalities, in the in their different positions in a class system, in their different um, relationships with gender? What does it mean to say that you love another person? What are you saying when you say that? Um, and so that was the question that I wanted to answer. I didn't wasn't trying to make a mystery of whether they loved each other or not. I was trying to explore what it would actually mean to love another person. And obviously the quote is, um, it's about how people can change each other, as you say, um, and about how sometimes nothing can change you until someone does. Right. Um, that, that, you know, people are waiting, almost waiting to be influenced by do, do, one do, person. Do you believe that? Um, oh yeah, I do. Because I think it's I very do. opposite of what everybody goes around talk, telling each other right, these years, isn't it? You, that, it? People say the opposite. You can, only you can change yourself. Yeah, so. I don't believe that at all. And I and I and I, I don't believe that at all. And I also don't believe this sort of like everyone should be very self-sufficient, and you don't need anyone else to love you. You just need yourself to love you. I think that's nonsense. I mean, of of course we're all connected in a in a network of human relationships all the time, which sustain us. I mean, people are out in fields picking crops so we can eat. People are making clothing that we have to wear. So the idea that you, you can move through the world as a self-sustaining individual is it's, it's a fiction. It's a, it's, a, it's a delusion, really. And so I don't know how that can apply interpersonally, by which I don't mean to suggest everyone has to find one person and get married at a certain age or ever. Um, but that human relationships are very important. They're very sustaining. Whatever form they take, they don't need to be conventional. They can be very unconventional. But they're not just optional. You can't just opt out of uh, the rest of humankind. Um, I, don't, I don't believe that. And I do find it a little bit strange, that, as you say, that there's this vogue for saying, well, it's all about yourself now. You have to be the one to love yourself and you have to be the one to change yourself because I don't necessarily believe that that's possible. Right. Are you, are you, uh, are you as a writer, did, when you talked before that you were not totally optimistic about the relationship ending in a positive mm. way, whether being Darcy or mm -hmm. or Nick and uh, Francis, or m maybe even these two here, because they are, in your new book, they are also trying to get away from each other mm -hmm. in a way, and they can't really. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's, it's like they're trying to not to get together in yeah. the end. Are you, as a, as a writer, uh, a bit pessimistic, or are you, as a person, a bit pessimistic about, uh, you know, romantic... Uh, happy ever after love stories? No, I would say I'm extremely optimistic. Um, I think I'm almost naively optimistic about, about um, the ability of human beings to love one another. And I am not, you know, I really like people. I don't have that sense of um, feeling disgusted with human society or feeling like, I mean, I'm, dis I'm disgusted with a lot of aspects of human society, but I'm never disgusted with people that I meet. I really like people. And so, um, when I write about people's intimate relationships, I can't help that I feel there must be some chance for us to, even though the obstacles may be very serious and may be very difficult to overcome, I can't believe that they're impossible to overcome. I have to believe that it's, it is possible, even not at, not at every moment, not in every situation, but that it has to be, you know, for me to carry on living and to retain my sanity in this world, I have to believe that's possible. So I think that that belief definitely comes across and, in my and work. And is that also part of your writing? Yeah. To, to keep that yeah, belief? Yeah, definitely. Yeah, I couldn't, I couldn't do what I do if I didn't believe that. Yeah. Right. Sally Rooney? Oh, thank you. Thank you. Thank, thank you all so much for coming. Wow.